Well, let's do it. Shall we do another? Yeah. Great. This is Out of the Dark, an audio series about Dark Hall, a theater built in 1929 in Regina, Saskatchewan. Through this series, we're exploring Dark Hall by hearing the stories of people who have been touched by this historic performance space. I am your host, Paul Deshane. Episode 7, The Wedding. The elephant lurking invisibly in the background of this series about Dark Hall is the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the period of time when these interviews were collected, Saskatchewan had to deal with the Delta variant and saw at times the highest rates of infection and death in Canada. We saw health measures lifted, put back in place, then lifted again. We saw protests and convoys pass through our city. It's been a rough couple of years. If at times I or the people I'm interviewing sound muffled, it's because we're wearing masks or socially distancing. And some of these interviews that may have been better live were conducted virtually. I I mention all this context because I think it's important to understand that when we're all talking about our excitement to see a restored dark hall or about our hopes for what we'll be able to see there, we're also talking about our excitement to be able to see theater and live music again. To be able to be in theaters and halls with people again. We're talking about our hopes for things returning to normal. I also bring this up because the interview you're about to hear with Michelle Ellingson Aylesby and Adam Aylesby was conducted in a booth of the Lobby Kitchen and Bar in Regina. You can hear the music and people in the background. It was the first time I had been to a bar with relative strangers in two years. We had food and drinks and got to know each other a little. It was a wonderful evening. Here's my interview with Michelle and Adam. Oh, actually, can I first get your names? <laughs> I have it. Like, a hello, I am. Sure. Hello, I am Michelle Ellingson Aylesby. Hi, I'm Adam Aylesby. Okay, so you guys actually got married in Dark Hall. Why did you do that? All right, well, that's a, probably a big question that I need to think back a little bit. But I think that happened um, when we were looking for a venue to get married in. Neither Adam and I are um, formally belonging to any sort of religion. And so we knew we weren't getting married in any type of church setting. We had talked about getting married outside. And then there was always the concerns of what will the weather be like. And we just wanted a place that was really unique and different, but also had still meaning for us. And I think one day we were driving by Dark Hall and we both kind of were like, that might be it, but would they ever allow it? And that became sort of like, well, this would they allow this to happen? But we had been to shows at Dark Hall together and always loved that space and live music and all of a sudden thought what a neat place it would be to get married on the stage in Dark Hall. And there in lied how it all began. But yeah, just something very different, and which is usually what we're always trying to do. Just a little different than the rest. The options when you're not tied into a church or a temple or something, the options become you know, a banquet room at a hotel, which you can turn into something that's you know, a little bit more meaningful for you, but it's not the same type of something special. And, and that's where we were looking to find something special. And, you know, going to shows and, and being there and just having that aura uh, was something that was different and, and unique for us. And we were kind of fit in our personalities and, and the way we wanted to celebrate our day. You mentioned that it was like an important space for you guys. Like, what kinds of things had you done there or been to see there? Well, one thing that happened, Paul, that I don't know if I shared, is that I decided at one point in my life to take an adult dance class. Uh, I re-brought back in tap shoes, and I convinced one of my friends to take this adult tap class. There was all the three of us, and we would go um, to the conservatory once a week for tap class. 
our instructor was much younger than us and all of a sudden said there's going to be a um, year-end performance of all of the now from the little kids right on up and would we like to perform in the yearly end production and the other two were like not really and I was like yes um, love performing and so we decided to do not one but two numbers and we we were part of the show remember coming at them to that show you weren't at that show why am I not thinking of that well we put on a show and we did um, monkeys and secretaries before my time and that maybe was before your time okay well that's one thing I'm gonna remember was taking out all tap and wanting to be on the stage in that show and anyway we dressed up as monkeys and we did a show performance, then we dressed up as secretaries. So I remembered that, and that was kind of fun. Well, it was on dark, it was on the stage, and it was like wow. everybody that was in all these dance classes, and it was like the year end performance or whatever. And yes, you know what? Maybe that was before your time, Adam. But that was one of my first experiences at dark hall was getting to be on the stage and feel like a kid again. Dressed up like a monkey. Dressed up like a monkey, and then we were dressed up as secretaries. Yeah. And then, after that, I think we started seeing quite a few shows. And the ones, the two, though, that continue to stick out are Hoxley Workman going to that show and Sarah Sleen and going to that show and watching her specifically play the piano and being mesmerized because the acoustics in there were unbelievable. So those are some of like, what I remember of my kind of connection to that space. And then, when we had our son... Um, I did kinder music classes there. And I have pictures of that as well, of us all sitting and rattling and, I don't know, we'd go once a week. Adam never came, like, it was like a mom, mostly a mom thing. Um, but we did kinder music classes there, and so that was kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Regina, and then I moved away, and then moved back and as, a, as an adult. And, and the only thing I knew about it, while I was growing up is I had some friends who were musicians who, who took the conservatory uh, classes as, as part of that. But other than that, and driving by it, I knew nothing about it, never been in it, knew nothing, and moved back as an adult. And while I was away, I, I lived in Chicago for a, a short time and went to, you know, great venues across the world that had, you know, history and aura and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and then, you know, I came back and we did go to shows uh, when I met Michelle shortly after moving back and, and yeah, it's just that, that idea of going to shows there and, and it rivaled all these other big places that I had been and, and venues that, that had you know all this history to it and, and my friends would tell me about it and tell me about all the stuff that, that went on and so you, you have that kind of a, an idea in the background and then you see the shows that are there and, and yeah, it was fantastic. How did it all come together? having the wedding there how did it come together well i still re oh i can say this part okay michelle is the master of convincing people to do the things that that we need to do and so when when it comes time to make the decision of we should try to to get that venue michelle figures out the way to do it and she hounds the people until they say yes Hounds? <laughs> in a great way Thank it's you. it's How she tracks that? them down she doesn't uh you know, take no for an answer when they don't get back to you by a phone call or an email. She phones again the next day and 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 hounds them until she gets to talking to in people. In a nice and, way, if you remember, it's in a nice way. Yeah, and and that's how it was. I think Michelle was the one that did, did all of it. Well, I do remember when I first made that phone call that they were very questioning of a wedding, and I don't. We, and I think they had never done it before. Or was it one it time? One in the 50s or something like that. Or it something was, like that. yeah, maybe that was what it was. Anyway, it was a whole new, like, okay. And they didn't even know, um, Paul, like, what to charge us. Like, it was that for in a concept. Because they're like, well, you're not hosting a concert. Like, it was all. And so there was a lot of back and forth because no one knew what to do with the request. But at the same time, I think they also didn't know how you'd say say no to that request yeah. um, I remember the only thing that they said is but we don't have a place for and that was the one side of dark hall that was always a kind of tricky right there's no um, place to overly mingle except when you come in that front foyer area yeah. and then but there's not a place to like to go get 
drinks or like that. And I remember them being concerned about that. And I was like, well, it's the wedding. We're not, we're not interested in, in that part of it. Right. We're hosting the reception somewhere else. Yeah. And I mean, if we could have there, uh, we would have, but you couldn't, and that we weren't concerned. Um, but anyway, they ended up, and I would have to look this up, but I think I told you, what they charged us was like ridiculously cheap. It was something like $1,500 or maybe even less than that. And they did all of our sound and lighting for us because I said, what do we do about that? And I remember them saying, well, I guess we can get you the sound guy. Do you remember? So he came to dress rehearsal. He was fantastic. And then he, I felt, did it like a production, kind of. And then we had Kirby there. So then Kirby was very helpful in figuring out that and sound and songs. And I remember this young guy did it all for us on our wedding day and afterwards said it was one of the coolest things he'd ever done because he'd never thought about something like that. And that's base and I also remember how many people even people that maybe we're not still connected to but for years later would say that that is a wedding that they will never forget because it was so unique and special and we involved everybody in in it but anyway it all ended up happening and it was great and I still can't remember but I want to say it was like really ridiculously cheap because no one knew what to do with us and yeah they threw in the sound guy and we had that space that night, too. They let us have it the night before for the dress rehearsal and let us store all our stuff there. You know, things that usually they'd go, no, you have to do it all that day. And then they let us store our stuff there overnight that night, even because they're like, no one's using it. Like, it was so casual. <laughs> and I like the staging areas because you got to feel like yes. you were like, all right, we're, we're, we're warming up. We're ready to go on for our big, it's uh, true. for our big you know You're show like stage left yeah. stage right but the dressing rooms in the basement and yeah, you, know, you got really to have fun. all your your uh your stuff your stuff but your your groomsmen and your bridesmaids you're all down mm-hmm. there and you had your own space to set up yeah, and to, to do that mm-hmm. and you just felt like you were about to go on and perform <laughs> right it was you know it, it felt fun it's and so you know, awesome. yeah mm-hmm. so they let you have the run of the whole building yeah that whole space mm-hmm. wow and when we were taking pictures about it afterwards we, everyone had left, and you know you got that time between, you know, when you're doing your pictures, and okay, we'll meet everybody at the reception in three hours or whatever it is, and we just started walking around the place and up and down and seeing, well, hey, this might be a, a nice place for some photos. And our photographer had come the night before and just walked around to say, you know, let's let's find some neat areas that might look good for a photo and. Yeah. It turned out really well. Yeah. How does it feel like now that you're like driving around Regina and you go past that, you know, a really prominent building in Regina? Like, does it feel like your space? I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it feels special. Like every time I look at it, it I honestly smile or I have a good memory of it. And I think I had also shared with you when I knew that they started building on that cadet. I really kind of struggled with that because I, I was worried about what that could do to that look of that whole area and I didn't want it to take away from the beauty of that building and I was hoping that if they, and I'm not saying that the building didn't need some <laughs> refreshing um, for sure, yeah. but I just didn't want it to lose that feel um, that you have when you walk in. And if people hadn't walked in before, I think when they did that day, they realized that because so many people that came said we've never been in here before and then we're like this is really cool and we're like yeah and it's like this little hidden gem that unless you really did attend something there as either a student or to see a show I guess why would you be there right so I remember worrying about that and even now I'm not saying that building doesn't look nice or whatever and I know they've tried to kind of blend it but it's just, I'm curious to see what the renovations will be like, but no, it holds like, it's just, it holds good memories. It holds, um, I don't know. Nostalgia. It really does. And it's something I'm proud to tell people about. Like when people ask, I think neither of us ever hesitate. You know, like sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to end up telling them I got, did this. It's at this. not like I got married at the Elvis Chapel or something <laughs> like that. It's the, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. A, I pr- guess. it's a proud moment. Yeah, us. it and, is. Yeah. We live in the we used to live in the south end, and now we live in the east end. And in both times, um, so I work downtown, and in both, uh, whether you're coming from the south or the east, I would take College Drive in. And so, I, you know, for 15 years since you know 
I've been driving past that building, and yeah, it's, it's a great uh, thing. I drive by it every day on the way to work, and I kind of <laughs> give it a nod or a glance and, and, and have that good, fond memory of it. And it's great. Incidentally, back in episode one, I interviewed Kirby Wurchenko, former theater manager for the Broadway Theater in Saskatoon. He mentioned that one of his connections to Dark Hall was that he was involved in a wedding that was held there. That was Michelle and Adam's wedding. They can explain. Uh, you guys were married by Kirby. Yes. Was he like the... We still had to have a marriage commissioner. Okay. Because Kirby, well, isn't licensed. So yeah. Kirby did the ceremony. His license had lapped. He was licensed at one point. Yes, he was. When but he his... was involved with something yeah. else. Anyway, so he did the whole ceremony and then for the legal part we had a marriage commissioner come in who actually was just fine he was good and he came in and he did the little bit of legal pieces he had never done a wedding like that either it's all to help you know <laughs> <coughs> oh my god like now or at yes, the wedding you talk uh, oh my gosh that was spicy yeah and, and so we broke it up and, and had that separate little part <laughs> where yeah. you know the you know the the marriage commissioner would come in and and that's when Kirby then involved others to to do that because there is that natural lull to to do that quickly and and get the signings all done and all that kind of stuff and so um but the vast majority of it was was Kirby Kirby who commands a room quite well and and understands how to bring everyone together while focusing it on on the people that you're there. Kirby is our what would I say about Kirby? Kirby is like our rock when we need a rock. He's our... And Tanya. And Tanya. And his partner, Tanya. Two of the dearest, best people you could ever meet that we get to call our dearest friends. And they're also people that you could not talk to for like two months and then pick up the phone and just start talking. You're listening to Out of the Dark a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM, CJTR, tuned into the community. How do you, how do you explain to people the importance of a building like that? Because, I mean, you guys have a personal connection mm-hmm. to it, but a lot of people just drive past it. That's a good question. It's a very thoughtful question. I don't know how you... Because I would think there's a few spaces in Regina that maybe you feel that way about and how do you convey that to other people you kind of stumped me Paul Sorry. Well, it's a good stuff though history but it's more than just history and I don't know I think it might be a collective history in that okay. it's a it's a space that allows people it, it's designed to have people come together and so there's history there there's a history uh, because it's it's such a it, it's not a newer building it, it has that that history but the history is a collective history and the history is the things that we did together and especially now in a time where COVID has us you know isolating we have social media that allows us to pretend to connect you know remotely with each other this is a space that says let us all remember about the things that we all did together interacting with each other and being in that space together and so it's it's not right to just say it's history there's a hundred buildings in Regina that have history you know the land titles building that's now a museum you know the the old building on the corner that is gutted out and has a, a history to it there's a million of those but there's not a lot of buildings that are old and significant that have a history that's a collective history of here's the things that we did together and how we came together and connected, whether it's a concert or a wedding or, or whatever it is, that collective history is what makes it different from just an old building. If you think of like a, a building like Dark Hall as being a space that's about like shared experiences and people coming together in it and that that's what sort of the building represents, for this documentary like what is there like a moment from that day that you guys can remember that you want people to know about like something that happened for you guys in Dark Hall 
that you'd like to share with Regina so that they can remember that when they see Dark Hall? You go first. The moment that stands out in, in our wedding to, for me is, is a part where we, we in, involved the people that came with us and supported us and were there with us at that day. And, and part of that was, was having them take some time. You know, there's always that awkward moment in the middle of your wedding where you got to go do the, that damn legal stuff <laughs> that, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. sign the things and, and have your witnesses and that kind of stuff. And, you know, and, and your crowd is at that point sort of twiddling their thumbs and trying not to get the little kids to scream and, and cry because, you know, there's a big lull and nothing's going on. And, and at that point, we had a, a very knowledgeable person, you know, uh, marrying us and said, this is the time to involve them. And, and so at that point, we, we, we had a, a vase at the front of, of the... When you came in, right at the start, and it had... It had a whole bunch of different nice rocks in it that filled the vase, and it was a nice uh, piece there. But what we did during that time is that everyone who came in, we asked them to take one of them and to, during that time, uh, use that moment to think about what being together and what be- being married and what being uh, you know a couple was the good things about it and what it, it meant to them and to give us good thoughts that, that we could take with us into our marriage. And so they would hold that rock and they would think of that and they would impart that memory into that rock. And at the end of the ceremony, they would leave and they'd, they'd take that memory with that rock and put it back into the vase for us. And so we have that in our home. And it's a, it's a vase that has our wedding invitation etched on it and, and the rocks from everyone who, who came to our wedding uh, that they held and they put some memories into that for us and, and that is that shared experience the time where everyone came together and and worked you know to be able to give us a memory that we could take away from that venue mm-hmm. wow yeah wow. I like that one a lot yeah it was lovely um, another one, I guess, that stands out for me is um, some of the music that was played that we had chosen were from all but, well, all the music that we picked were from artists that we had seen together, um, quite a few at Dark Hall. Michael Fronte was at Folk Fest. We ended with Michael Fronte dancing out. Loved that. That was a good memory. But and I will say that was before dancing out. Your wedding was was popular. Was the, the popular and the thing to do, or it wasn't choreographed. But we no, it was not choreographed. <laughs> there was no <laughs> choreography. Um, but part of what I remember is one of Adam's dearest and oldest friends is an amazing musician, and who, who had actually was the musician that friend of mine who had been yeah taught at the conservatory when we were yeah. growing up and, and, and so he was playing guitar and he Adam had asked him to play well first a tragically hip song ahead by a century and we are such die-hard hip lovers would be kind of an understatement of how much we love that band um, and connected over that band when we first met so he started playing that, but then the music all of a sudden I realized was changing into a song by Madonna. And I was like, I did not, what is Mike doing? I did not, and it was acoustic, so I was like, what is happening? And at that point, in a ceremony, Adam says to me, um, his, he wanted to give me a gift and had got us tickets to go to Chicago to see Madonna perform, who I like also fanatic about and I and this was in the middle of this so he had Mike start playing this song and I remember be- by oh, and I so just remember being utterly confused Paul and standing for all these people going like what first of all why is he not playing this is not the song we picked and Adam trying to tell me and then I remember looking at him too and going I have to work and then my boss was in the audience, and he's like, I, I've approved everything already. It was like this funny kind of, 
weird surprise. surprised moment that he just took that time and that was this gift that you know on the we're gonna head to Chicago in a couple of weeks and he wanted to show me around where he lived and it was just a really cool the music was amazing people loved all the music um, oh Jason Plum love Jason Plum and the Waltons we'd seen him and then one of my songs that I walked into was his song <laughs> forgot about that look at all these memories you're bringing back anyways that was a moment for me, and I remember everyone start laughing. I remember the laughter because they were catching on that they didn't know exactly what because it was they couldn't quite hear. But then when it was all kind of shared, I remember the laughter of everyone going, "This is so funny!" And Michelle was so like looking for my boss, going, "I have to work," and he's like, "No, I, Adam, talk to me. It's all good." <laughs> so that was my other moment. Otherwise, yeah, the rocks was mine too. When I first started working on the Out of the Dark project, and people were talking to me about the great shows they've seen at Dark Hall, Hoxley Workman's name kept coming up. For the few who don't know, Hoxley is a singer-songwriter and multi-instrumentalist from Toronto, whose brand of cabaret pop is beloved across the country and around the world. He's performed at Dark Hall several times, his shows being described to me by various people as magical and perfect. His 2010 show there was part of a Regina Folk Festival concert series. James Brotheridge was a music writer for Prairie Dog Magazine at the time, and he was at that show. You reviewed a show, a Hoxie Workman show, at Dark Hall in 2010. Yeah, my recollection is that my partner already had tickets to the show, and then the show sold out because Hoxie Workman was quite popular at the time. And I was feeling a little envious and decided to agree to review the show or at least kind of use my music writer privileges to get my foot in the door that way and still get in even though it was sold out. And so that worked. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I was snuck in or how above board it was, but uh, because, you know, the show, I'm guessing, was at capacity or whatever that meant for Dark Hall, I had to watch the show from the balcony. And if I try to recall it i don't think there was anyone in the balcony with me because it wasn't like the balcony was a space for seating at like a kind of folk rock concert like that you know they were pretty much just allowed to be on the floor especially since i think the balcony wasn't in as good of repair as the floor seats yeah actually my understanding was that the balcony had been closed because of structural concerns (laughs) Well, my foot didn't go through the floor like Money Pit style or anything, so I think I was okay. Good. Do you remember the show, anything about it? Well, I remember that he had a pretty lengthy set. You know, at the time he was touring his double album release. He had released two albums, one called Milk, one called Meat, which to my ear these days sounds like a pretty gross two of album titles. <laughs> but uh, that's without any context, I guess. But yeah, he had... Um, and, you know, that was pretty reasonably deep into his career at that point, I think, you know, he had already had like, you know, kind of uh, some uh, simmering success, I would say. And then, you know, he'd even had like some kind of radio success to some degree. And yeah, that show really felt like it was kind of in line with that release of albums because he had kind of divided the show up as, you know, there'll be this opening stretch where it's the kind of, if not quieter than at least kind of the, folkier side of Hoxie Workman, followed by him putting on these industrial, you know, ear protection and then going out and doing like the rock side of Hoxie Workman, which is my kind of understanding of the divide between those two albums too. Which side of Hoxley Workman are you more on, the folky or the rocky side of Hoxley? Probably the uh, folkier side. Yeah. And I don't know, that's where some of his kind of eccentricities, I think, come out a little bit more or at least from, from my experience or my, my preferences with his earlier albums. And going back over that review and kind of thinking back to that time, like that side of him also kind of came out in the banter on stage. Like, you know, 
I don't know. He, he was a professional by that time. He had toured for countless years inside of Canada and out uh, at the same time. So with that, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was pretty good at on stage banter and, and throwing out an anecdote. He really felt like in that show, he was just kind of following his muse whenever he kind of went up to the mic and started talking. He was really willing to just kind of uh, go on for, for an extended period of time if he felt like it. Good show? I think good show. And, you know, that was like a, a run of shows where uh, the Regina Folk Festival concert had done a few at Dark Hall. You know, um, they've always been pretty good about kind of mixing it up with regards to what venues they do in town. And I was always really happy that they got the chance to do shows at Dark Hall, whereas I don't know if other presenters... Uh, I don't know if it was a matter of trust or if it was just that they didn't have the relationship, but, you know, other presenters just didn't get in there that often to present that kind of show where it was pop music, rock music, folk music. Uh, but even when he got to the kind of rockier side of things, I think it was, you know, still a, an appropriate venue for it. It was a cool venue, too, like around the same time. I know Dan Mangan played there uh, and, you know, that was cool. And I think I saw Joel Plaskett there and that was also cool. I spoke with Hoxley Workman about those Dark Hall shows and why he finds such venues so interesting. When I started my career in the late 90s, you know, my agents at the time were like, oh, yeah, I know you skip Saskatchewan. Like you go right from you go right from Manitoba to Alberta. And it's just like, I mean, even 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 though I was like a newbie young person looking to you know the, the industry to tell me what was what i was like that's not right like and i remember saying to my agent like what i know is blue rodeo is a canadian band and blue rodeo plays everywhere and they play regina and so we're absolutely playing regina while regina and saskatoon because saskatchewan is a little bit less populated th those are harder shows to fill but over time they were full and then over time I got booked into Dark Hall and I remember arriving for the first time to play Dark Hall and feeling in a way like this is what the last six or seven years of touring and, you know, being on the ground and putting the time in gets. It gets you a faithful audience in a city like Regina that you've well earned. And here is a great opportunity. Finally, you're not playing the state. You're not playing, which is fine. Or you're not playing the uh, the uh, the festival place that's Kitty Corner to McQuaid's. I also quite like that venue. But you walk mm -hmm. in, it's like, oh man, I'm going to do a really big show in Regina in this very cool old classical music theater. Uh, you can tell it, it was, you know, the backstage downstairs. It's a really warm and receptive place to hang out. Even like it's little things like that when you're a touring act that like, that there's a vast downstairs of green rooms and places to kind of relax and feel like you're, you know, they're clean, they're nice. Like when you have been on the road a lot of years, it's simple stuff, you know? And I feel like Dark Hall was that feeling of arrival in Regina. Like I've earned my way into a proper venue in this city. And um, it, it always felt like a venue too, because it was a little off the beaten path. I don't even know if there was that much pop music being booked in there before or after me. So I always felt like as well, like people would come up to me after that show and go, I've always heard of this place. I'd never been here. And it's incredible, you know, which is always interesting to me because like, while I am just a rural Canadian who has rural Canadian cultural instincts, there are moments because I lived in Paris and because I have traveled where I go like, it's a bummer when you have an extraordinary venue in your town that you've never been in or had any cause to go in. That to me says then a venue is a build it and they will come proposition, i.e. we have this place. Let's create culture together because of this space. And so, you know, and I've been that artist from time to time because I have outgrown certain club venues and it's like, well, where are we going to put this guy? He can't play the 4,000 seat place, yeah. but he can play the, 800 seat place and then they find a place like dark hall and then all of a sudden i play a, a show that people still remember 12 14 years after and i think i'm somewhat responsible for that but i also think the venue is responsible for that the other thing about a wonderful venue in a town is that it sets the tone for the evening yeah. i've always worked with my with my booking agents to like try and 
try and have the instinct to always be offering um, the people who are interested in me and my music an exceedingly respectful and inspiring environment because I'm in the business of return customers. So like, if even if I do a great show in a horrible venue where there's a terrible bouncer who is ugly to everybody who comes in or out and, and the beer is 14 bucks and, and it's, and there's nowhere to sit. And like, all of a sudden I could be having the show of my life, but you're looking at your watch going, I can't wait to get out of here. So a venue is really, really, really important. And I felt that the dark hall proposition in Regina was the first time I'd played in a concert venue. I mean, I've played in another smaller concert venue now, which you could probably remind me what it's called. I did. It's a very, very small local public theater. Um, actually, it, but it's privately owned. But anyway, oh, like, would that be at the Artesian? Did you play there? Yes, the Artesian. The Artesian. Wow. Yeah. Different. Very different thing. It's. It's the Artesian is not dark hall, and dark hall is not the Artesian. But I'm just. I'm very interested in special venues in, in cities as the jumping off point for building culture, you know, like, and so obviously if somebody's put millions and millions of dollars into dark hall, somebody else thinks like me, it did have that sort of like Masonic temple type. Yeah. Nobody yeah. goes in or out of this building type feeling to it. Like, yeah, it felt like there's two small man doors on either side of the, you know, east or west side of it or whatever and and it didn't it you're right like it it it's not a welcoming building as i recall but like once you're in you know you're in a beautiful place but so yeah. you're saying they've 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 upped the welcoming vibes a bit like it feels like so. okay that's cool i mean to me this is wonderful and especially at the tail end of two years of not knowing whether or not really my job was a real job anymore like to know that like cities and people are still putting the idea of culture and gathering together at front and center is very inspiring because there is from time to time i do find myself in very low moments thinking we're never we're never going back out and we're never going to be able to shed this fear of one another and i'm like i'm getting tired of it but it's nice to hear that like Maybe it will be venues like this that inspire people. Like, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable going out, um, but I'm, I want to see the show and the venue has been, you know, it's beautiful and I want to be a part of it. Like maybe it will be the added thing that gets people out the door. Cause I think we're all still a little bit like, ah, I don't know if I want to go out there yet, you know, <laughs> I mean, I have been going out, but it's my work, you know, and I'm like, yeah. I can't, I can't abide by the fear narrative for myself because I feel like I have to sort of show, I have to be an ambassador for the other side of like, look at me, I've, I've been out and I'm fine, you know, but so dark call. Yeah. Congrats. It's so great for Regina. I'm so pleased to hear about it. It's wonderful. Um, I don't suppose like people have spoken a lot. I think it was your 2015 or your 20. Well, those are the two shows that I found reviews yeah. for, but there was the 2010, 2015 show, but they all talk about the vibe of your show at Dark Hall. I don't suppose you have like any like memories yourself of like what the feeling was like playing there. I do because the show, the 2010 show, as I recall, was um, had some oddball orchestral instruments. It, everybody was in these green jumpsuits. It's a tour that we toured all through Norway, Sweden, Denmark, wow. Germany. Like that tour was very expansive. And I remember it being a bit oddball and I remember there being quiet moments in the Dark Hall show that were the kind of quiet moments that happened that we all, they were like um, like frozen in amber, those moments in a great live show when like, because sometimes you, you go for that quiet moment and there's that one guy in the audience who's uncomfortable with quiet and he's got to go, woo, or something like that. And kind of, but I felt that in Dark Hall, there was a willingness in that room. Like we all submitted to some old ghost that was ruling in there. I just remember this moment too, where I can't even remember what song, but it, it started to happen on this, um, in this particular song, Night After Night, where people would lightly tap their toes. I can't remember what, but I remember that everybody kind of caught themselves like, we're all quietly tapping our toes here in Dark Hall. And it's all very musical and mystical. And I could just feel that like, woo, that chill of like, wow. Like uh, just one of those effortless moments, you know? And again, 
you know, I'm, when I've played my first big show at Massey Hall in Toronto, of course, like Canada's Carnegie Hall or whatever, yeah. I remember my dad calling me and he was really excited. And he's like, oh boy, you're going to be really excited about this. I'm like, dad, I'm just not thinking about it. What do you mean you're not thinking about it? Well, I said, dad, honestly, it's nerve wracking to think about. And I said, here's the thing about performing. You can have a shitty show in a brilliant venue and you can have a brilliant show in a shitty venue. And so I'm telling you this because it's not worth me investing anything in the idea of playing Massey Hall because it might be a dud. It might be a dud show in a great room. So, But one thing is for sure that if you're starting off in a great room, I believe you're much closer to having a good show than if you're starting off in a crummy room. You know, like there's a lot of magic and like, it's like esoteric religion stuff. When I figure out after 30, 25 years of touring, 1800 shows or whatever it is, and I'm still trying to figure out when, are, how can I guarantee everyone to be great? And you can't mm -hmm. because there's so many variables. But when the venue is right, that's one of those variables that just is like, look, when you walk into Dark Hall, a city like Regina that we know maybe doesn't have a regular exposure to a classical music theater like this, people are going to come in and go, wow, this environment makes me want to have a great night. And when I walk out onto that stage and feel that energy, it makes me want to have a great night. You know, yeah. I'd also say the other thing that made, if I'm being honest, the other parts that made those that those two shows, 2010 and 2012 or whatever, 2015, whatever it was, you know, my relationship with the Regina Folk Festival and with um, Sandra and her team at the time, like yeah. we were like this. So there was another thing where like an extraordinarily care, beautiful and care filled meal was prepared for us backstage, right down to freshly churned butter. And like, like, so not only was the show great, but the care and tenderness that we were being treated, uh, how we were being treated backstage, it meant that the, from every minute of that day was, was elevated. So I, I, I wanted to remember to say that because those, the folks at the Regina Folk Fest, that's a great team of people and has always been wonderful to me. And we were at the height of our, like, our love together because like, you know, I was kind of newly minted as an almost famous guy. And like, they were like catching their, their rhythm as like, the Regina Folk Festival was all of a sudden like one of Canada's most important folk festivals. And it was like, like we were like young people who, who were putting our lives into our careers and it was like starting to work. And like, so yeah, like th that was the other thing. So behind the scenes at that magic dark hall show, there was a magic meal. Oh, and the, the, the woman who churned the butter and made everything handmade also made mead from scratch, homemade mead, churned butter on freshly baked rolls. Like we were in a very magical headspace that night. Folk Fest people are, are fabulous. It, it, it turned, that folk festival is every bit as important as any other major folk fest in Canada. And we all know it as artists who play it. Like cool. it, it, it moves the needle for our careers when we play that, you know? It, it's a true to life community festival, those daytime shows. And I've played those daytime shows and it's like- yeah. Yeah, you get a lot of curious people who might not be able to afford to go. And like a, fe a, a city festival, especially like, and that's the other thing about, I mean, I know we're not talking about Regina Folk Festival mm. on this call, but the that's fact cool. that it's a downtown city festival, like I love downtown city festivals. I mean, I like the Winnipeg Folk Fest and those, those destination festivals as well, but there's something about when a festival comes to the city proper that like, it feels like, it feels community, it feels community centric. And yeah. I, I think that's been another one of the strong things about, but you know, any music scene in any city is comprised of a lot of very energetic people working way beyond their, their capacities or their limits or their job descriptions to create culture opportunities um, for artists and for audience. Like, Sometimes when I look at all of the people involved in making culture happen, even the decision to renovate a, 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 a venue like Dark Hall, like in the 21st century where we sit, I'm surprised they do that. And maybe that's just me being negative, but like, you know, with the talk of the metaverse and, you know, people kind of going into their Oculus yeah. lenses and whatever, it's like, 
I'm always heartened when I hear that like somebody is 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 putting their their money where their mouth is on this like old fashioned community entertainment proposition. It's crazy. You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR, tuned into the community. Do you have any thoughts on, like, we, we were making a huge investment in Dark Hall, which I think everybody involved is, like, very enthusiastic about. It's difficult to explain why it's so important to ex- to preserve sort of that the, the aesthetics of those old buildings and keep, you know, the old bricks in your city. I really bounce around on this one because do you know that joke about how many folk singers does it take does it take to change a light bulb? No. Four. One to change the light bulb and three to sing in harmony about how they like the old one better. <laughs> like I'm that guy. Okay. Like I'm yeah. I tend to be the old way was the better way, that Luddite thing. Yeah. And I'm really trying because modernity is leaving me and people like me in the dust. So what I'm what am I trying to say? I believe that artifacts of cultures gone by and architectural eras gone by, especially these magical times that are, you know, 80, 100, 120 year old buildings, like modernity really has a grip on us right now. The the internet is not going to let go. Um, It's, it's, it's drastically upended our lives. I know we're kind of not supposed to talk about it, but in a hundred years, they're going to look back at the late 20th century, early 21st century. And they're going to go, those poor, poor people had to deal with this extraordinarily dis- disruptive technology that came out of nowhere. And it changed their lives irreparably, irrevocably for good. And if there's anything, as we move into the internet era and Gen Xers, I'm assuming you look Gen X to me, I'm guessing. Very. You- very generous. Yeah. We Gen Xers, the last generation that had any association to the pre-internet world, we're going to be gone. And then a certain era of history will start to disappear the, from our brains, from the brains of people. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like, if anything, these buildings are, are there to satisfy or play the role um, of... of like they, they hold the space for the memory of those times that are well gone past. Because I think that was one thing for like people like you and I living in the 20th century, especially the late 20th century, like <clears throat> there was still so much of it that, that the impulse was, 19, was from the 1960s. Like yeah. folk festivals are an impulse from the 1960s, let's be honest. Touring and singing songs in front of an audience is an impulse from the 1960s. So I know that that impulse from the 1960s is also going to start to wane when the baby boomers start to go because it was ultimately their generation that created these cultural impulses. So these buildings are all that we're going to have left as portals into the past for anybody who wants to, who wonders what was life like before, you know, everything was Ubered, all, all manner of, of labor was outsourced all anything quaint, anything that was small, anything that was bespoke, anything like, I feel like a room like Dark Hall needs in some ways to be preserved to give the future context, especially in a city like Regina that like is still, I feel, and I love that town, it still struggles to kind of find its niche and like, you know, it with it's got its it's economic ups and downs with whether, you know, depending on, you know, whatever, uh, whatever is being pulled out of the ground, if it's, if, if the price is up or down and like, you know, sometimes you can feel some of the social dilemma that's in that town. And like, I just feel for a town like Regina because it is these monuments that start to, I think, underpin some of the identity that's possible. But again, like I'm a culture worker. So like, I always think, oh, like have a concert and save the day. You know, like I know that's not always the answer, but yeah. for me, tearing buildings like that down, it, the space that's held for that memory disappears. And I think that, I think there's, there's reason to hold on to some of our past. I think that, and I know as Canadians, we're really reckoning with that right now. Like how much of our past do we want to like, we got to admit, 
we've been yeah. involved in some unsavory stuff and how are we going to move forward? And I know that like, oh, well, some of these um, items from our history are unsavory and we do have a difficult relationship with them. You know, I don't know if, for me, a venue like Dark Hall, whatever was spent is going to put Dark Hall into the future. There will be shows there in 2040, 2050. There might be community gatherings there. Let's say that we just don't know what the future holds. I think we are all under the assumption that we feel that something is tenuous now, like our good old solid, rigid, sturdy pasts of like, you know, here we are, like, you know, I, I think that we're, everything feels quite tenuous. And that's, an, I think, another thing that in times that feel tenuous and uncertain to have an old regal building like Dark Hall remind us okay. that like, that some things just stand. And sometimes you got to stand through the good and stand through the bad to arrive a hundred years later and still be relevant. Like I'm an architecture fan though, you know? And for me, it's yeah. like, for me, architecture informs the way we want to live. When I used to live in Paris, you know, people would be like, oh, the Parisians are so snooty. It's like, they are, but you would be too, if you lived in a city that was infinite and endless beauty, you'd walk through the day going like, how do I not feel above everybody else? When I lived in this gold capped city, uh, these extraordinary, there's something extraordinary to behold every, every, every corner. So I, I do think that there's something about architecture and respect and creating a dignified gathering place for humans is, it's powerful stuff. Huge thanks to Michelle Ellingson Aylesby, Adam Aylesby, James Brotheridge, and Hawksley Workman for sharing their stories and thoughts about Dark Hall. You've been listening to Out of the Dark, an exploration of Dark Hall through stories. This series was made possible thanks to the generous support of Sask Arts and the University of Regina Conservatory of Performing Arts. Dark Hall is situated in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Makeshift Nation. Music for Out of the Dark is from Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, 465, and performed by Christian Robinson and Hang Han Ho on violins, Jonathan Ward on viola, and Simon Fryer on cello. They are Regina Symphony Orchestra performers. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Thank you for listening.